Today we're going to talk about Eternity Comics. Now that's an ambitious name for a company that lasted less than 10 years, but within that time it weathered some pretty dynamic lawsuits and gave rise, gave a platform to a bunch of exciting new talent. You could even argue that it helped pave the way for Image Comics. So without any further ado, let's talk about an important piece of comics history. Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. If you know comic book history, there's a great chance you remember Malibu Comics. They were the original publishers of Image Comics in 1992, and Marvel Comics actually bought them in 1994. They were founded back in 1986 by a guy named Scott Mitchell Rosenberg. But what nobody knew until the following year was that Rosenberg actually was funding several small independent publishers, including Eternity Comics. So, why was this man running so many different publishers? Well, a lot of that has to do with the incredible popularity of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a small press comic that launched in 1984 and its reprints kept selling out. It really came at the right time when the direct comics market comic book stores instead of just newsstands, gave rise to a number of independent titles. Books like Usagi Yojimbo and Cerebus would flourish in the mid-80s, and Scott Mitchell Rosenberg took notice. He was running Sunrise Distribution at the time. Rosenberg began his career in comics selling them through a mail-order service called Direct Comics when he was only 13 years old. And eventually, he launched Sunrise Distribution on the West Coast to distribute the comics from the printer to the comic shops. The Overstreet Comic Book Marketplace Yearbook 2015-2016 to interviewed Tom Mason, a cartoonist who ran Malibu at one point, and he said that Rosenberg had funded, along with other investors, a series of small publishers including Eternity Comics, Wonder Color Comics, Amazing Comics, and Imperial Comics alongside Malibu. By controlling both the comics and the distribution, Rosenberg was looking to artificially inflate demand. Mason claims that when the 80s indie comics boom collapsed, this ended up being part of what hurt other comics publishers that were smaller, and a lot of them closed shop. Eternity Comics was easily the most visible out of the small companies Rosenberg had funded. The Comics Journal issue 115 from April of 1987 broke the news that Rosenberg had financed the four imprints along with Malibu Comics. Eternity likely lasted the longest because it had some genuinely good comics. The most notable in its early days was X Mutants. The title was written by David Lawrence and was the first professional comics work for artist Ron Lim. Within two years, Marvel had scooped Lim up, and he became the artist on Silver Surfer, and he made a name for himself there and on the various Infinity Saga books. X Mutants followed the story of a post-apocalyptic world devastated by nuclear war that had turned all of humanity into mutants. A scientist is able to create a process that transforms five teenagers back into genetically pure humans. He then sends them out into the world with the goal of rebuilding humanity and inspiring the warring factions of the world to reunite. It makes sense that this book was a hit. Ron Lim is a talented artist, and while the book is post-apocalyptic, if you actually read it, it's kind of light adventure. Also, let's look at that title. X mutants. A prominent X, a big word mutant. There was obviously some attempt to cash in on the extreme popularity of both the X-Men and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There was probably an attempt to maybe confuse the readership, make them think that there was a relationship, or at the very least there was a similarity. The writer, David Lawrence, essentially says as much. 
The X-Mutants book only lasted eight issues, but did inspire several spin-off titles at Eternity. However, X-Mutants quickly became the subject of a quiet legal battle by 1987 between authors Lawrence and Lim and the publisher. The comics story continued in the summer of 1987 at publisher Pied Piper with the new title, The New Humans. In the introduction, writer David Lawrence explains the behind-the-scenes story from his point of view, writing that David Campiti, working for Rosenberg, had approached Lawrence about writing a book called Young Ex-Mutant Samurai Humans. While Lawrence thought that was a bit silly, he agreed to write the book. Lawrence wrote, at the time, David was working with Brian Marshall at Eternity Comics. They were financed by Scott Rosenberg, the owner of Sunrise Distribution. Perhaps David should have had more reservations. There was nothing really illegal or immoral about Rosenberg owning a comic book company, but with all the secrecy he demanded, there were times we could hardly help feeling there was something shady about it. X-Mutants No. 1 finally appeared in August, and around that time, serious problems cropped up among Campiti, Marshall, and some creators. At that point, Rosenberg separated them and set each up with his own companies. The split-up resulted in the creation of Amazing Comics and Wonder Color Comics, led by David. Brian Marshall was left with Eternity and a new company called Imperial. It was at times almost a competition with Eternity, a contest to see who could put out the most books and make the most money. I'm not going to judge who the winner was, but I will say that I never regretted my decision to leave Eternity. For the next several months, I worked in the Campidi and Associates offices as an associate editor for Wonder and Amazing, as well as writing X Mutants and several other titles. At first, Everything went very well. But then, payments stopped coming on time, then finally at all. Money for office expenses didn't come either. And Scott Rockwell, our art director, and my roommate, and I each went several weeks without salary. Then, on several occasions, there was interference with our editorial decisions. Finally, the situation became intolerable. Rumors surfaced concerning plans to dump our company and pirate our projects away. So we're making as clean a break as possible, and we'll continue our efforts to see everyone he owes money to, including David Campidi, Ron Lim, Tim Zahn, and me, and other creators, and creditors as well, are paid. X-Mutants continued at Eternity, and confusingly, there were also special editions of X-Mutants published through Rosenberg's imprint Amazing Comics as well. Behind the scenes, Rosenberg at a certain point was looking to consolidate everything down to just one company, and ultimately that ended up being Malibu. Eternity had a history with playing fast and loose with the law. Uh, obviously, the ex-mutants legal situation is just the tip of the iceberg because Eternity also crossed paths with Disney and Japanese publisher Toei. Just wild. In 1989, Eternity printed two issues of a book they titled The Uncensored Mouse, complete with a black cover. It was the first English reprint of the original 1930s Mickey Mouse comic strips, containing the stories Race to Death Valley and Lost on a Desert Island. Eternity was under the impression that the Floyd Gottfriedson comics had fallen into the public domain, but they didn't check. In fact, Disney had renewed the copyright on their strips back in 1957, which protected them all the way through at least 2005. Eternity was notified by Disney lawyers, and only two of the six issues that Eternity had solicited were published. The comics were notable enough to be discussed on an April 1989 episode of Entertainment Tonight. Another early hit for Eternity was an adaptation of Robotech. Eternity was at the time publishing an American manga, Ninja High School, by Ben Dunn. According to artist Tim Eldred, Eternity asked Dunn what other Japanese property they should adapt along with Robotech, and Dunn recommended Captain Harlock, the space pirate manga by Leiji Matsumoto. Eternity was in touch with Harmony Gold, who had adapted Robotech for TV in America, and had recently mashed together two anime series, Captain Harlock and Queen of a Thousand Years, into another English TV show. 
Harmony Gold told Eternity that the Harlock rights had reverted to a company called Coral, which Eternity contacted and licensed the rights for a new U.S. comic book version for three years. Towards the end of that period, Eternity was contacted by Toei Animation, who asked why they were making this comic. As it turns out, Toei had never licensed the rights for Captain Harlock to anyone in America for any sort of English adaptation. Coral ended up just being a name for some guy in Florida that was scamming the rights out of people. He never had the rights to this product. And it's amazing in retrospect to see that Eternity twice in a row never really checked to see if they had the legal rights to publish books. And they really lucked out that both Disney and Toei Animation decided that it wasn't worth their time to sue them. They just asked them to stop printing the comics and left it at that. Eternity was pretty lucky in that regard. Now, I mention all these lawsuits and you're probably wondering, well, if they had these many problems, like why were they still around? And the answer is Eternity absolutely had an eye for talent. By today's standards, some of the books Eternity was putting out may seem amateurish. And the fact was, it was the first published work for a lot of creators. Future Catwoman artist Jim Balant got started on covers at Eternity. Evan Dorkin is one of the funniest cartoonists in comics with his books like Milk and Cheese and Dork. His book Beasts of Burden with Jill Thompson is another highlight following a group of intelligent animals investigating the paranormal. But he got his start at Eternity with the sci-fi humor book Pirate Corps. Brian Polito's self-published character Lady Death was the beginning of the popular bad girl art phase of comics in the early 90s. She got her start in Evil Ernie issue 1, which was published by Eternity in 1991. Jimmy Palmiotti is well known for writing characters like Harley Quinn, Jonah Hex, creating original characters like Painkiller Jane, and overseeing the Marvel Knights imprint, among other things but he broke into the industry inking titles for Eternity, where he says he was paid two to three hundred dollars per issue. And everyone knows Rob Liefeld, Bloodstrike, Blood Wolf, Young Blood. Well, one of his earliest paid jobs was doing covers for ex-mutants. Knowing that Liefeld did some work at Eternity also opens up the door to wondering whether his character Shatterstar from New Mutants was inspired by the Eternity book the White Devil. I don't know. You tell me if you see any similarities there. It seems that Liefeld must have kept up his relationships with the folks at Eternity because in 1992, when Liefeld helped found Image Comics, the original publisher for those books was Eternity's parent company, Malibu. In 1988, Malibu began sort of consolidating the imprints that it had underneath it and after 1988, Eternity began to slowly wind down. Malibu focused on acquiring existing small imprints like Air Cell and Adventure Comics. Adventure Comics is where Malibu housed their licensed titles like Planet of the Apes, Alien Nation, and Rocket Ranger, which was technically based off of a video game, but of course is meant to be the Rocketeer. Air Cell brought a lot of porn and Men in Black. Eternity hung in for a while with reprint books like Cat Claw from Serbian creator Bane Karich. And they partnered with cheapy studio Full Moon to make comics based on their movies like Subspecies and Trancers. But Eternity closed its doors in 1994 when their two longest running titles each moved to other publishers. Ninja High School moved to Antarctic Press and Robotech moved to Academy Comics. Malibu also shuttered as a brand at the tail end of 1994 when Marvel bought them. At the time, there was a lot of speculation that Marvel had bought Malibu for their then-advanced digital coloring techniques. But honestly, if that was what Marvel wanted, Marvel had the resources to just start that up, independent of buying Malibu. No, the truth is much more mundane. The fact was DC began looking to acquire Malibu Comics because they had a superhero line, the Ultraverse, and Marvel realized that if DC bought Malibu, they would technically have more market share. 
So, Marvel beat them to the punch. That whole Marvel buying Malibu really was the biggest story about all these companies, and it really means that Eternity was more of an afterthought as all the companies wrapped up around 1994. But what happened with the guy that funded all of this, Scott Mitchell Rosenberg? Well, Rosenberg was hired onto Marvel as part of the Malibu sale, but he left in 1997. He then bought out the majority interest in Platinum Studios, a company who would acquire intellectual properties in the world of comics with an eye to turning them into movies and TV shows. Men in Black had proved how lucrative that could be. Platinum produced the TV show Jeremiah, for instance, based on a Belgian comic. They also produced the American movie version of the Italian comic Dylan Dog, but the less said about that stinker, the better. <laughs> <laughs> and they made Cowboys and Aliens. It was an idea for a movie, but Rosenberg decided that if they had the best-selling graphic novel, that would help speed things up in Hollywood. But similar to how Rosenberg kept it a secret that he was running several comic imprints along with a distributor, Platinum kept it a secret how they got huge sales numbers for Cowboys and Aliens. Platinum had told comic shops that they would write them a check in the five figures for ordering their book. Essentially, it allowed stores to sell Cowboys and Aliens for 50 cents or give them away for free with purchase. When Diamond Distribution learned what they were doing, they adjusted the sales numbers and Cowboys and Aliens fell from the number one most ordered graphic novel of the year to number 12. But it had worked because it got enough publicity for the movie to get made. There's a lot more to say about Malibu itself. I mean, they were there in the early days of Image Comics. They had their popular Ultraverse line of superheroes. But the brand that I honestly miss the most is Eternity. Uh, books like X-Mutants were very fun at the time, and I remember that they were doing some of the earliest American-made manga on books like Ninja High School and Robotech. It just felt different. Um, they had weird titles like Dinosaurs for Hire and Cat Claw, and I remember thinking that Eternity was kind of like the schlocky cousin to a lot of the other 80s indie publishers, people like Kamiko, First Comics, uh, Kitchen Sink Press, who else? Eclipse. Anyway, it's fun to remember back then. Eternity is kind of forgotten these days, but the fact is, the comics that they made and the creators that they introduced absolutely remain. I've got one more funny story about how they handled the Captain Harlock anime, but I'll talk about that over the credits. Thank you so much for watching, and until I see you next time, remember, keep reading comics. Hey folks, thanks so much for watching this episode. I just have a quick story, but if you want to see this in more detail, there's a fun channel called Corn Pone Flicks that's an expert on more anime adaptation stuff. Uh, anyway, Malibu had promised that there would be an all new translation is that subtitled? Is that dubbed? Who knows? Of Captain Harlock that they promised would be uncut and brand new and everything. But when it came out, all it was was an existing translation by an older company. Um, it was a dub. Hilariously, what they did in the first episode is they totally mistimed the audio. It came on about five seconds too early and it was just completely out of alignment. So different characters were always talking with what you'd hear. Just a really bad anime that Malibu actually put out. Now let me see a smile. Why did you come here? They're waiting to kill you. Really must have been done on the cheap. If you can find it, it's pretty funny. Just know going in that it's not very good. They make new synthesizer music that's nowhere near as good as the original score. 
uh, it's it's just not a good adaptation. But kind of a funny story, it's just that it's not about the comics, that's about something else they made. I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to be back real soon. I really appreciate your support. And hey, thank you to my patrons. I couldn't do this show without you. Thank you very much.